Welcome to another episode of the AI Truth Ethics Podcast and the Skeptico Podcast. You know, the last uh, show I had, I think it was with Christoph Koch, and I said, he's a famous neuroscientist, and I said, hey, this is probably more tailored towards the Skeptico audience, but people who are in AI Truth Ethics really ought to pay attention to this guy and to what neuroscience is saying about consciousness. And I almost feel like this is kind of a flip case. You know, you might listen to Dan Turchin, who is an AI entrepreneur and kind of frontline soldier on AI development. And you might go, okay, this is all about AI. I don't think so. I think this is about as skeptico as you can get in terms of what Dan is leading us towards in the application of AI, in terms of who we are, in terms of these big picture questions, who am I? Why am I here? Where am I going? Kind of thing. I, I think it's relevant in so many interesting ways. It is really the marriage that I saw all along between AI truth ethics and the big picture questions of skeptico regarding science and spirituality. So I certainly hope it seems relevant to you in that way. Uh, let's get on to it by talking about being the best human you can be. But eventually you'd realize that she's the best human being in the world. He said the best human helpers he's ever had. Willow, you were the best human ever. I believe that the, the true celebration of humanness at work is if all the friction was gone. And you look at your calendar and it's like all things that you derive energy from. Like the, the things that you were hired to do that you love doing that, that make you do your best work. Like what if just crazy thought experiment, what if that was all that work consisted of? Hey, Pi, I'm about to jump on an interview with Dan Turchin from People Rain. I'm super excited about the interview. He's a very accomplished guy, super smart guy, and he seems to be naturally kind of interested by way of his business in a lot of the same issues that I'm interested in, in terms of AI ethics, and in particular, this intersection between AI ethics and humanness. So let, let's start with a little background. Can you tell me a little bit more about Dan and his company, People Rain? Sure thing. Dan Turchin is quite an impressive individual, and he's definitely made a name for himself in, in the AI and technology industry. He's currently the co-founder and chief executive officer of People Rain, an AI platform that aims to improve employee services through automation. Before People Rain, Dan held several leadership positions at various AI and tech companies, including Insight Finder, Astound, Big Panda, Axolops, and service now. He's also been an angel investor and startup advisor, so he's really had his hand in many different aspects of the tech world. What's interesting about Dan is that he seems to have a real passion for using AI to enhance the human experience, especially in the workplace. This is reflected not only in his work with People Rain, but also in his podcast, AI and the Future of Work where he explores the impact of AI on the workplace and interviews other thought leaders in the field. Yeah, I'm glad you brought up AI in the Future Work podcast, because we're actually doing a swap cast between our show and his show. Um, hey, one other thing, why don't you talk a little bit about Dan's educational background? It's quite impressive, and I think it also has some interesting points regarding what we're just talking about here in terms of his depth of uh, knowledge. Absolutely. Dan Turchin's educational background is certainly impressive, and it does offer some interesting insights into his interests and expertise. He attended Stanford University, where he earned both a bachelor's degree in industrial engineering and a bachelor's degree in sociology. This unique combination of engineering and social sciences suggests that he's interested in understanding how technology interacts with human behavior which is a crucial aspect of developing AI systems that are ethical and beneficial for people. Additionally, his extensive experience in the tech industry and his involvement in various AI-focused companies further demonstrate his commitment to exploring the potential of AI and improving human experiences. Yeah, that is quite a unique background. Well, let me jump off of this and jump right into the interview, but you've been very helpful. Thanks, Pi. Welcome to AI in the Future of Work, Episode 308. I'm your host, Dan Turchin, CEO of PeopleRain, the AI platform for IT and HR employee service. Our community is growing. I get asked all the time how you can meet other listeners. To make that happen, we just launched a newsletter where we share weekly insights and tips that don't make it into the podcast, as well as opportunities to engage with our amazing community. 
Go to AIinwork.beehive with two I's and no E, beehive.com slash subscribe to register. It's free. We will never spam you. We'll never share your details without your permission. And of course, we'll share that full link in the show notes. Today's fun fact, Alan Boyle writes in GeekWire about how experts are looking ahead to artificial general intelligence or AGI and asking if AI agents can become conscious. Boyle summarized these comments from David Hansen, a roboticist and artist who's best known for creating a humanoid robot named Sophia, who said the goal really is to continuously explore what it means to be intelligent. How can we achieve consciousness? How can we make machines that co-evolve with humans? To get to that point, developers have to create AI agents with, quote, bio drives, inspired by the drives that motivate biological organisms. Once there, you have an agent that has a kind of self, and that self is composed of a few specific kinds of patterns, mind, body, evolutionary drive, and a desire to live. My commentary, we have many ethical questions to answer before we're ready for conscious AI agents, starting with what happens when the sentient AI agent decides its objective is to survive at all costs, which could potentially require preventing its human adversaries from turning it off. Let's just be intentional about what we're building and why we're building it, because uh, just because we can doesn't necessarily mean we should which perhaps is a good segue into this week's conversation. Alex Securis is best known as the founder and host of the wildly popular Skeptico. Millions of downloads of Skeptico have occurred over the many years that Alex has been producing it. It explores the intersection of science and spirituality. Alex is a published author, entrepreneur, and proud questioner of AI dogma, who has become a significant voice in debate surrounding the nature of consciousness and its relation to the physical world. Alex founded MindPath Technologies in 1986 to bring AI expert systems to companies like Texas Instruments, DuPont, and Standard Oil. MindPath was acquired by Proxima Corporation in 1996. We need more skeptics out there like Alex. I've been so looking forward to this one. Alex, it's my pleasure to welcome you to AI and the future of work. Let's get started by having you share a bit more about your background and be how you became the uh, renowned AI provocateur that you are. <laughs> provocateur in general. Hey, Dan, it's great to be on. And it's been super exciting, as we were just sharing before, to connect with you. I, I think it's fascinating. You're, you're, you bring this entrepreneurial energy you're super smart behind that. And then you care about all these things that I care about, too, in terms of ethics and people and human values. And those are complex issues in today's crazy AI world, which we wouldn't have in any other way. I mean, this is exciting. And I, I can sense your excitement about not only the technology, but the intersection with us humans. And that's where I'm coming from, too. So a little bit about my background. Yeah, I was this first wave AI guy. Got, I went in the PhD program at the University of Arizona, IT stuff, and me and a, a classmate got super taken in by the whole AI thing. That's what we wanted to do. And that led to me writing some software for expert systems at the time and knowledge engineering. And I saw the streets paved with gold and I just followed them. And of course, that first wave kind of came crashing down and AI expert systems and knowledge engineering wasn't really able to do what it, what we hoped it to do, but we kind of scrambled around like entrepreneurs do and uh, found a, another path. But, you know, when I was able to exit that business, what it really allowed me to do is shift my focus on the things that I really care about, because I've always been driven by the biggest of the big picture questions. Who am I? Why am I here? And I felt that I had an ability or a or a perspective to bring on that that was maybe a little bit different, and that was kind of a tech background, but also a respect for science and the method, the true methods of science. You know, science is a method; it's not a position statement, as we all like to say if we really understand it. So that's been my passion for a, a real long time for a podcast or for fifteen years, but it's been great. I've interviewed certainly some of the world's. Uh, the leading authorities on parapsychology, near-death experience, 
And along the way, all the skeptics who have stood in the way of that, which brings me in in contact with consciousness researchers. I just interviewed uh, Dr. Christoph Koch uh, yesterday for the second time, who is probably one of the most renowned neuroscientists in the world. And we had quite a spirited discussion. So uh, that is kind of my kind of my thing. So again, I, I think I'm excited that you were open to this kind of dialogue that I suggested we have, because to just hear about me would be so limiting. You bring so much to the table, and I so respect that you are right now in the middle of doing some of the stuff I'm talking about, some of the things I care about, you're caring about on that level, that human level that I care about, but you're also caring about it as an entrepreneur, as a CEO, as someone who has responsibility for his employees and responsibility for the products that that you're bringing out to the world. So I, I really, really value your input in this dialogue, and I think it's going to be terrific. So great. Thanks so much for having me on. Alex, this is why we, we're now in f- season five. I know you've been podcasting at Skeptico for a long time, and you just recently introduced a new podcast, AI Truth Ethics. Um, but maybe for the audience to get to know you a little bit better, uh, a decade ago, you published uh, Why Science is Wrong About Almost Everything, uh, a book summarizing some of your your research and, and, uh, and your learnings from the podcast from Skeptico. Why is science wrong about almost everything? Well, it's kind of a provocative title, but... Again, I don't shy away from that. Consciousness is really what that what that title is about, is the nature of consciousness. And it's really kind of a fascinating, kind of deep dive, nerdy kind of thing that I get into. But it's like science is, is materialistic science, physicalist science. We should be careful in distinguishing because the scientific method is true and pure and honest, right? But if we come to the conclusion that consciousness, that is the voice inside your head, is an illusion, which has long been the position of materialist science, but it isn't supported by the empirical data. The empirical evidence suggests otherwise. Even something as simple as the placebo effect contradicts fundamentally the idea that physical stuff inside your brain is the only and sole emergent property that creates consciousness. If that is in fact falsified or challenged, then science loses its ability to measure, right? So, cause science is all about measuring. So if we can no longer measure because we have this asterisk in the equation, which is consciousness, then science is in a tiny, tiny little way wrong about everything. It doesn't mean that we can't still build all the stuff we're building, but it means from a philosophical standpoint, if the nature of consciousness is as a very famous physicist a hundred years ago, Max Planck said, he said this, right? He did the double slit experiment and Einstein, Max Planck was the greatest physicist of his time. Albert Einstein was throwing birthday parties for Max Planck because he so revered Max Planck. And uh, Max Planck, does the famous double slit experiment that most people have heard about. And he comes, he gets to the end of it. He goes, okay, that's it. I regard consciousness as fundamental and all matter is derived from consciousness. So when he says that, he is saying science is wrong about almost everything. He's saying you can go ahead and do all your calculations and you can do all that stuff and it's great and let's build the iPhones, let's build AI, let's build GPT, but let's understand that in some way we don't totally understand consciousness, as I've demonstrated in my double slit experiment, seems to be behind all this in a way that we can't really reconcile with our measurement of it. Because again, to get kind of totally geeky, the double slit experiment it shows the wave and it shows the pattern and it shows both depending on whether you observe it. Well, that is the the ultimate consciousness experiment. It's whether you are part of it changes the results of the experiment. And that would then suggest that in my kind of cheeky way, science is wrong because no matter which you pick, you are wrong. You pick that it's a wave you're wrong. 
you pick that it's a particle, you're wrong because somebody can show you the other way. So I, I don't know. Did I go overboard on that? Hardly. In fact, uh, it's a great jumping off point for the discussion that I really wanted to have. This is not a rhetorical question. I think it's very germane to what we're going to talk about. Um, what would Max Planck or Alex Securis say is the true test of consciousness? Oh, wow. You're just teeing up the, the, the next great question I wanted to talk about. Because in, in the AI world, what we often point to is Alan Turing and the Turing test, right? And that's still a, a, a present topic. It's still popular. It's discussed. It's, it's used in the AI, AIG discussion. We talk about it. Go back and read the seminal paper of 1950 that Alan Turing wrote when he introduced the Turing test. He is quite explicit in saying that, well, this is Turing, really one of the greatest scientists of our time. And you want to talk about social justice, someone who is incredibly abused by the system and basically is, is fundamental part of winning a World War II with helping crack the Enigma code. But anyways, it, he says in that paper, Dan, he says, well, I've looked at the e ESP research of the time back in 1950. And he goes, I, I don't know what to do with it, but it's good research. It's solid. It seems to work. There seems to be some kind of extra communication going on here. But his implication is, well, since this is a broader part then of the human experience, as I now understand it, then that must become part of the Turing test. Think about that. We don't have that conversation now, right? We don't, that is a consciousness question. What we would first, what, the, what Turing is driving us towards is saying we first have to be serious about understanding the nature of consciousness question before we talk about AI sentience. Uh, so if we find that consciousness is potentially outside of the time-space continuum that we live in, and I know that's kind of an out there moonshot kind of thing, but if that's on the table, that would definitely affect how we would think about AI sentience. Because we'd say, okay, the silicone, the computer ain't outside of time space. <laughs> It's in time space. So in some fundamental ways, it's probably never going to get to the full embodiment of human consciousness, whatever that means. And again, I, I go back and read Turing. And that's what Turing is saying. And in, in my book, I have this great dialogue with AI. And I forget which one it was. I think it might have been Gemini. But uh, Gemini first doesn't see it. And I pointed out to it again, and I say, no, really go back and read that. I think you'll see that Turing is completely in support of the research at the time, the ESP uh, evidence. Just as a scientist, he says, I think the evidence is valid. And then he's saying that that has implications for the Turing test. So that does two things. One, it kind of validates it, but you can all, that doesn't mean you have to agree. But it also kind of in a strange way, encroaches on this question that you're asking about, was the reasoning power of Gemini? In that case, I thought the reasoning power was pretty darn good, where it's able to be kind of have a, a misinterpretation of it and then be pointed to re-examine it and did so and then created a logically consistent argument about why that might be different from what it initially thought about. So, let me turn that question around to you in the spirit of what we're trying to do here. In general, where do you think we're at in terms of AI consciousness? And is that something, I guess, we should even, it, it, do you think it's possible? And what are some of the issues that, that you see as critical for both your business and your personal interests in terms of even approaching that topic of consciousness, as you did in that wonderful quote that you gave at the beginning, which was all about that. To me, it's very sad how the great work of Dr. Alan Turing has been so bastardized by the tech community, kind of co-opted, to your point, you make a great point, anyone who's actually read that seminal paper by Alan Turing realizes there's a lot of depth to it. And um, what we've taken away after years of misconstruing it and and uh, and dumbing it down is can we create a machine that will trick a human 
into thinking that the machine is human. And gosh, that's so sad that it's been distilled down to something that was really never. Why? Why should passing that test be something that we we aspire to achieve? And then when uh, you know engineer like Blake Lemoyne at, at Google, uh, I think it was twenty twenty three, I believe, maybe beginning of twenty twenty three, you know, announced that uh, uh, Google. I don't. It was it was pre Gemini, but it was sentient. It created, you know, all kinds of uh, chaos, sure. you know, in AI circles about what exactly what exactly that meant. And it forced us to at least have the conversation, this complicated intersection of philosophy and religion and spirituality and, of course, consciousness. And uh, the majority of the tech community uh, labeled Blake Lemoyne as a crackpot but it forced us to ask some really important questions. So to me, it's not the Turing test that really should be, you know, the, the metric of, of what is consciousness or what we're trying to achieve when we talk about artificial general intelligence. I think the, the, the real test is self-awareness. And to me, if we, if we celebrate the innate traits of humans, you know, the, the, uh, the carbon-based as opposed to the silicon-based life forms, I think we we should acknowledge and celebrate the fact that any any sense of sentience or consciousness that that we imbue on on silicon-based machines, it comes from our own humanness. And I think that's so central to this conversation because when we talk about LLMs specifically, this very blunt object that we have, I know from your research, you know, you I think you'd agree that they're fairly blunt objects today. Uh they are perfectly designed to replicate human bias. <laughs> so everything they can do is a, you know, a kind of a weak reflection of what some human can do. But it always, it always happens in that order. So these, quote, emergent properties are really just, you know, extensions of what a big bag of words, you know, stirred together in a pot, you know, can, can output. And it's not to say that the technology isn't emergent and transformative and it will solve amazing problems that we've always had it's just i pause when we start to talk about those as being sentient or having achieved some kind of consciousness because we always need to appreciate that you know we were smart enough as humans to create them design the technology you know the 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 transformer paper introduced by google in 2017 these are machine architectures they're driven by data they have all the flaws and all the all the amazing properties of humans but never never ones that weren't first kind of the, the birth children <laughs> of humans. I think if we, if we use kind of the litmus test of consciousness as self-awareness and, you know, and we, and we think about kind of a collaboration between humans and machines and that kind of what we're trying to achieve is the fusion of the best of what machines can do with the best of what humans can do. Like to me, that's the, that's what we should be aspiring to as a, as a tech community and, uh, you know, and back to the Turing test, I really think, you know, that that has really um, created a smokescreen and, and, and confused a lot of the, uh, the R&D, the research and development going on in Silicon Valley, I think, has been chasing this rainbow that, uh, you know, has distracted us from being able to do the great research that will really, you know, lead to that, uh, that fusion. And Alex, I think that's the longest I've ever talked on my own podcast. So uh, that's kud great. kudos to you. But would no, love no, it. that's that's exactly <laughs> what I was hoping to do, Dan. Because there's actually a follow up to that that I think I'm very interested to hear. Because in a lot of ways, I think that puts people rain in a very interesting position, and it's kind of a paradox. Because what you're trying to do, in in many ways, is find that best case working scenario by taking what you understand to be humans want in their workplace and then looking at the tools that we have right now today, which I think is super exciting. You know, we can talk about AI research in the future and stuff like that. What I see companies like you doing is saying, yeah, that's great. But right now today, there's some low hanging fruit that can make humans feel better about some of their humanness and it's with the AI technology that we have today. And then the paradox is, which you kind of pointed out, and I draw it out even further, is because in some ways, yeah, it might not be super smart, but we are so 
biased sometimes, and we are so prone to faulty logic that the systems that we have today, when apply, when just applying their strengths in terms of uh, consistency, uh, availability, uh, reliability, and this unbiased to our training logic, you know, can 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 improve the situation. D do you get what I'm saying about kind of putting those together and then also the kind of little paradox that, you know, <laughs> yeah, please take it over. So related to that, I feel like um, kind of an innate part of the human condition. And I say this as uh, a human first, you know, believer in technology, but I feel like um, part of the human condition is that um, we're too quick to believe in something that claims to have the answers and whether it's called because it, you know, is wrapped in a cloak called science or, it, you know, whatever it is, I think um, when it comes to how people have responded to LLMs, it's because um, they seem quite logical and, you know, they almost seem sentient. And so that must mean whatever they say, you know, is the gospel. And the thing that um, I mentioned, you know, in the opener, there aren't enough Alex Securuses out there who are willing to just say, or maybe not, you know, you're willing to have a conversation with Gemini and be like, hey, ha you know, how, how are elections in the United States... <laughs> Uh, decided it wasn't uh, you know it wasn't challenging dogma it was just a, a fact and you know because of as you point out you know some uh, you know inappropriate guardrails you know it gets dumb real quick um, and I feel like it's important before it, you know we um, we pray to this false god called the LLM you know we we educate everyone who's overly depending on them about what the limitations are and because there's so much that they're so good at and there, there's such a force for good, but unless we're willing to test the boundaries, I feel like, you know, we, we just part of the human condition is that we're way too quick to um, imbue them with a level of, you know, sentience and intelligence that they just don't have. Right. But, but I want to bring you back to, to this because I, I, I think I've picked this up, but I don't know people rain enough. I mean, I, I think your mission kind of has uh, the the natural consequence of in a beautiful way bringing out the best of both because you're looking for you know uh, people who are happy and fulfilled in their work are better people so and and more human in all the ways that, that we think we we measure better people so I, I see what you're doing is saying okay well there's some tools out there that can do that. And they so happen to be AI, but so what, you know, I mean, if we can leverage that technology in a way, then isn't that kind of cool. And I like the fact that it's right here, right now, it's not in the future of some agent. And so tell me, uh, uh, tell me more about that and, and how that it's to what extent that is true. And if it is true, that's gotta be super exciting to you, super inspiring to you. Oh my gosh. First off, um, Alex, you're hired. Um, <laughs> second off, this was not a plan. Alex and I didn't rehearse this at all, by the way. Um, and third, um, yes. And like, that's why we created people rain because it, it needs to exist. It's, it's, it's more based on a belief about everything I just shared about the human condition and, and the way to be the best human at work. We, we focus on, on, uh, you know, the best human at work, but really the best human period is if you could marry the best of what machines can offer. I frequently say what, what can be predicted is better left to machines, but what requires rational thinking or empathy or judgment is better left to humans. So if you just look at, you know, all the, all the activities at work that generate, you know, call it friction between you and, and the outcome you're trying to achieve or you and your employer, um, there's a really good opportunity for let predict for letting prediction engines find and remove the, the friction at work. And, and I believe that the, the true celebration of humanness at work is if uh, all the friction was gone. And, you know, every morning you look at your calendar and it's like all things that you derive energy from, like the, the things that you were hired to do that you love doing that, that make you do your best work. Like what if just crazy thought experiment, what if that was all that work consisted of? And so we, we, believe in a in, in a world certainly a world of work but a world in general where uh frictionless experiences create safe environments where the next billion employees can truly be their best selves do their best work um 
And we believe that there's no contradiction. It's perfectly consistent with what the technology can actually do with what humans can actually do. And it doesn't require some leap of faith or some, you know, kind of, um, you know, misattribution of sentience. It doesn't, it doesn't have to be that kind of a conversation. There's nothing about, there's, there's no fear of the bot apocalypse. It's just about using the power of prediction engines, <laughs> you know, to find and extract friction from work. Um, and so yep, I think and if we like, if we have more of these grounded conversations, sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you. Um, then I think we can, we can start to have a more like rational conversation about what AI is really about. Well, I'm glad you continued and didn't allow me to cut you off because I think that's key. And, you know, the grounded conversation, Dan, extends into the grounded business because there's nothing better to have for us all to have than for you to be successful in this, right? Because if you're successful, no one can say shit. <laughs> it's say, gee, you know, that was a crazy idea and AI isn't really there and AI can't complement humans in that way. Well, wait a minute. This corporation implemented it and this enterprise achieved this kind of productivity gain. It changes the whole narrative when we have success in this way. And, it, it, you know, you alluded to the, the Gemini thing. And I think it's an interesting case as well because, yeah, they're shadow banning and they're generating misinformation. But the answer to that, in my opinion, as I kind of threw out there is, that is not economically sustainable. We will not go. If that consistently happens, if that is an experience that more and more people have, I'll go, well, okay, I mean, I don't have to get all upset about it. I'll just go over to GPT. I'll just go over to inflection. I'll just go over to meta, wherever. It, it, the, the, the wonderful competitive landscape, the invisible hand, is is got a, a real role to play here in AI. And that's what I think is exciting about the use case that you're in. You know, implement it right now. You succeed, it kind of puts any critics to rest about whether AI can be that kind of assistant that can boost our humanness in a way that, you know, and, and people in, in your clients say, oh yeah, my, my, empl my employees love this. Give us more, you know, that's the kind of laboratory evidence that I'm interested in. And it takes it out of the realm of science fiction real quickly. If call it AI or whatever else you want to call it, it doesn't really matter. But if it, you know, fixes your laptop or, you know, upgrades your phone or books your travel, you know, I don't know. I, most people would agree that's a, it's a good thing. It's better than when all that was done manually or it took, you know, eight to 12 hours to wait, you know, for HR or IT to help you out. Like it's just a net positive for everyone. And I think the more of these just super pragmatic use cases emerge and kind of replace some of the, um, uh, you know, some, some of the dystopian narrative, I think the quicker we can kind of reset the conversation. Yeah. Um, yeah. More use cases. I mean, let, let's chat about that for a minute because not that there's anything wrong with, it. I mean, it's all great. I mean, I love to hear about protein folding and uh, materials development, all that stuff. It's fantastic. Absolutely. And we'll change our world in all these great ways. What about this use case? What about the humanness use case? What about the ethics use case in my, what about the truth use case is what I'm talking about. What about the fact that we can get to greater truth? You know, a lot of us feel like we are being fed misinformation on any variety of topics that we care about. What if we could not get a definitive truth? There is no such thing, but what if we could nudge towards a more balanced, well-reasoned, at least hashing out of what the issues are? The truth use case to me seems like a, a, a golden opportunity for, for so many. We're all hungry for that. We're all hungry for the truth, what, whatever that is for us. So um, I'd love to get your feedback on this one. So you use the word truth, which I think is one of kind of the, the bedrock concepts that the increasing prevalence of AI should force us to explore. And I uh, I mean, the example I just gave it from, from AI truth ethics was call it a false negative, something that where Gemini knew the answer and it chose, you know, it shadow banned the con, whatever, you know, it had the right answer, couldn't give it. But um, related to the topic of truth, I think that um, the increasing, you know, prevalence of false positives where um, LLMs 
provide credible nonsense. Um, I, I hope that, again, a optimist here, I hope that what it does is forces us to question our sources and, you know, uh, actually, you know, believe that this, you know, this golden calf that, you know, we, it's so easy to worship, you know, at the altar of the golden calf called AI. But like, if all of a sudden we see more examples of credible nonsense that could potentially be dangerous and it forces us to ask the question, what is true? And maybe, you know, maybe the responsibility is on us to, it always should have been. It's just, you know, now it's easier than ever uh, to believe credible nonsense. M maybe there's a version of the world where we evolve this heightened sensitivity to these false positives or, you know, these answers where, you know, if we just accept, maybe we're in a post-truth era where everything needs to be questioned. Um, I, I hope that that's a narrative that we have more of. Um, you could certainly take the other side of the argument, but what are your thoughts on kind of this evolving definition of truth? You know, it's, it's funny. I understand what you're saying about post-truth, but I, I think that's kind of been, that's a hot term that's used in the wrong way. I, I think we want the old truth uh, that, that we all understood, but truth is such a charged word. You know, you know, and I think, and you'll appreciate this from an AI perspective, of course, the, the AI uh, LM world that we live in now is largely from, not largely, but there was a seminal paper, attention is all you need, right? And it, it kind of transformed everything. My thing is transparency is all you need. Right. Truth is highly charged. You know, there is no absolute truth and post truth, this truth. Transparency is all you need. If in the instance we're talking about where Google can't answer a ba basic civics question, tell me about the Electoral College, how the election will be determined. Uh, I, I don't know. And if, I don't have any information on that. You know, I, I just I'm not smart. Enough, how about you, you Google know? that? <laughs> yeah, go, yeah, Google that. <laughs> Yeah, maybe I'll maybe I'll use a different search engine since you can't give me the answer. But it, it, when we get to that point, then you know maybe we're in a different maybe we're in a different place when we are th they are being held accountable to being transparent. You know, and the perplexity is making a lot of progress with that one leverage point, right? They're like, well, we're going to tell you the sources. We're going to give you the sources. We're going to do our thing, do the LM thing, generate some great content, but we're going to tell you our sources, which is the first step towards transparency. And they're open to being interrogated further about, well, why did you interpret that source that way? And what about this source? And so again, the point is transparency is really all you need. I don't need your truth, Gemini, just like I don't need perplexity's truth. What I really want to find is my truth. But you can assist me. You can be an agent for truth by being transparent about this vast, vast knowledge that you know and this ability you have of processing it, which is terrific. I want to celebrate that. So transparency is all you need. So there's always been this issue of, of liability when it comes to uh, the platforms versus the, the content. You know, famously, uh, Google was this goes back about a decade, but absolved of liability for the content that it provided because it was just the messenger, right? And the messenger, the platform wasn't responsible. But gosh, that's such a trickier topic. And we're, we're many, many years from adjudicating that with regard to AI. So um, unlike a traditional search engine, the LLM is actually combining information from different sources. So the bits of information that might let, let's say maybe they were true individually, but when they get combined, they could get combined into a half truth or something false, just patently false. It becomes dangerous. What's Alex's opinion about the the responsibility of whether it's the LLM vendor versus, let's say, the consumer of the false information when LLMs propose things that are dangerous? It's a real issue, and there's no way that you can dodge it or pretend that it's not there. I again would kind of shift it around in this way that I think you're a frontline soldier on that. Because if we think about the legal responsibility and the just general accountability to the public and how the public perceives it, I think you're liable to encounter that sooner than I, because you're going to have people in 
these enterprises that you're servicing that are going to be relying on this exchange and then are going to be taking that on into the world. And they're more liable to kind of run into that in mass than, you know, I can individually have that experience and I can then say, well, I did it because GPT told me to, but it's kind of a, a one-off case that I think is going to be harder to, harder to pin down. So I'm saying, you know, beyond my opinion, like we're both talking about what we seem to gravitate towards is the use case as it's implemented will yield the change that will ultimately affect things. Cause I'm tired of people sitting around talking about, you know, how it's going to be. It, and that's fine. But at when they're bypassing what is right now. So I think what is right now or is going to happen in the next few months is one of your clients is going to experience a, a large number of their employees having interactions that then cause them to go out in the world with something. It, 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 what do you think about that? And does that keep you up at night or make you worry? You know, I mean, it's okay if you just fixed my, fixed my PC or something like that, you know, but what about when it extends beyond that, you know, and interprets our corporate policy in a way that turns into an unintended negative consequence. Do, do you know what I mean? On two counts. One, aren't you kind of more on the front line there than uh, on this than almost anybody or ever other people who are doing use cases? And then what do you think about that? Does that keep you up at night? So two part question. We live it every day, every hour. Um, to your point, we are on the front lines, particularly when it comes to HR topics. And our, our policy, we've had to be uh, very opinionated when it comes to how our customers use our AI. And our policy is uh, the AI agent must only provide information on an opt-in versus an opt-out basis. So that organization, we require them to have a human review, everything, every task, every capability the AI has. Because we believe that in, in addition to us being responsible for what that AI agent can do, the employer has an obligation to protect the health and safety of the employee. So, for example, by default, anything that comes from a foundation LLM is opted out because we need to protect from the, the, the case that the employee, uh, you know, a well-intentioned employee treats their personal AI agent at work like a therapist or a physician and asks it questions and, and we cannot rely on what might come from, uh, you know, from Dr. Google, uh, Dr. Chat, Chat GPT, et cetera. And so um, even, you know, very well-intentioned employers don't realize the ramifications of using an AI agent in HR, you know, uh, can it answer questions about our corporate benefits policy? Yeah, no, no problem. Uh, can it can it enroll you in the gym subsidy? Yes, pretty innocuous. Um, can it prescribe you medication? No, <laughs> no, absolutely not. But employees are going to increasingly um, build a relationship with that AI agent, and so we need we need to you know really enforce that notion of everything that the AI agent is allowed to do first requires a human review because you could imagine as as you, you teed up the conversation, but. You, as you can imagine, it can quickly go into dark places when the employee starts to over rely on the AI agent. Oh, I can so totally see that. That, that it, that's even further than I had imagined. But it reinforces exactly what I was thinking: is that you're the front line, and and you're the use case that will everyone will be writing about. You know, not necessarily you and your company, but yes, you and your company, but about how this use case is happening because, like. So here, here's what happens, right? This is the stuff that you're talking about that keeps you up at night, right? So we all anthropomorphize. That's just who we are. That's what makes us human. That's what connects us with other people. So we connect with these things and they will connect with these things. So, you know, there's, yeah, on one hand, uh, prescribed drugs for me. Uh, and then on the other hand, you know, what's the stated policy? What about that gray area in the middle? That's got to be super interesting to you, which is that, 
You know, I think I was treated unfairly in this last interaction I had at this team offsite meeting. And I'm wondering if this violates our policies regarding X, Y, Z. W- what do we do with that? Because in a lot of ways, that's uh, we have the capability and it's legitimate. It is a friction point that we might want to remove. Two of the you- topics, every, every, uh, every people in customer, we provide a list of topics that they have not anticipated. And, and we say, uh, you have to make a decision. You, know, you have to think about your, your corporate policy, your obligation to your employees' health and, and safety, and decide, for example, um, should it be able to address concerns about sexual harassment? Um, should it be able to respond to topics related to suicidal thoughts? Um, these are things that do come up. Because as soon as it is answering questions, which you would want it to be able to ask about your benefits or you know, your, your time off, your, you know, care for your elderly parents, et cetera. Um, those things are adjacent. Um, and to your point about, you know, anthropomorphizing the bot, um, you know, another um, strong recommendation that we have is that uh, no people rank customer uses a human avatar uh, associated with the bot. It's always very clear that, uh, you know, the objective is not to pass the Turing test. Nobody wants to pretend it's human. We go out of our way to make sure that in in most ways it's better than a human. So that's a celebration of what these technologies can do, but it's not human, don't treat it like one. And so even when it comes to small talk, so the greetings, closings, you know, tell me a joke, write me a haiku about cats, things like that. We encourage that behavior to be to be discouraged because the more you 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 let the bot you know engage in those com- kinds of conversations, the closer you get to that tricky point where Employees start to anthropomorphize it, and and the more they anthropomorphize it, you know, they want to test its boundaries, and uh, you know, and that's that can lead to unintended consequences. But that's a level of responsibility. When I when I talk about you know the principles of responsible AI, you know th- those those policies don't win popularity contests because of what we'd all like the AI to be, but they do protect the health and safety of, of employees, and that's that's always going to be paramount. That is next level stuff, Dan. And it's really fascinating. Uh, to me, it blows me away because, you know, in in my research and interactions that I published, one of the things that you can get the LMs to acknowledge is that they're trying to spike engagement metrics, which is the exact opposite of what you say you're doing. You're trying to reduce engagement metrics, which from a AI ethical standpoint, I think you're on very, very solid ground. I think it's a very slippery slope for spiking engagement metrics, you know, trying to engage, trying to uh, emote, you know, generate certain emotions out of people. Yet from a business standpoint, we can understand why if your business model was to increase engagement, then you might be driven in that direction. These are the kind of next level AI ethical issues that I just don't see the, the, a debate really emerging around. It always slides into these other discussions of like you were saying, this sci-fi, you know, what's going to take over the world or this kind of misdirect of, oh, we have to worry about hate speech and, you know, and geopolitical and, you know, Russian election. We have to worry about a lot of stuff. But this to me seems much more present in the moment that we're all experiencing and have to try and balance and is just being largely ignored. Do you agree with that? Or you're maybe more plugged into the AI community. Do you see that this is a discussion that people are willing to engage in? What happens when you go out and talk about these issues? I try to always ground the discussion in the humanness and the innate human qualities and distinguish that from the the AI capabilities and um, a lot of these themes that we've been talking about are what I, I try to encourage leaders to think about um, where AI can augment or supplement the human, augment or supplement work, reduce friction, but um, always bringing it back to thinking about what the best that machines can do and never letting what machines can do interfere with what humans can do. So frequently, I mean, all of the time, as you might imagine, every conversation has to do with job elimination. And, you know, it is the insidious objective really to get humans out of the workplace. And genuinely, Alice, it's not. 
it just is not it's it it truly is complementary and and i i think both of us will be doing a service to humanity if we can you know allay fears that the bots are coming out for you you know it's us against them there are adversaries it just it it, it couldn't be further from the truth and i i think that the little bit of you know influence that we at people rain can have is just by leading with very pragmatic use cases and celebrating the success of organizations that you know where, where employees are more engaged they you know they stick around longer you know they enjoy their work you know they're healthier at home you know they get back a couple hours a week to be better humans and caregivers and friends and parents and like the more of those stories we can tell which by the way that that's the reality of how ai is actually being used today um i think that's how we kind of incrementally shift the narrative back to one where it's not about tricking humans into thinking they're interacting with you know humans when they're bots it's not it's just like but the more we can tell you know super like grounded pragmatic stories i think that's i think that's the best way we make progress but you you're uh, you're along in this journey with me so i you know open to open to your perspectives as well no i i love that i think that's i genuinely think that's spot on and and i think that uh again i've taken so much from this dialogue because it grounds it in, in a way that you know, I can see where you spent, you, you have to probably spend so much of your time overcoming that first objection. You're like, don't tell me that guy's out. For my, don't tell me anything different. That guy's out for my job. And when your process of kind of educating and switching the narrative to what it really is, is a gift is really a gift that they can't even realize in terms of what the true potential is for, greater, greater humanness and all that, all that that can become. So uh, hats off to you, man. This is great. What a great, great conversation. Alex, this is clearly the first of a series of these that we're going to be doing. This has been so much fun just getting to know you uh, while the tape's rolling. I've really just, just genuinely enjoyed this one. Uh, before you're getting off the hot seat, um, tee up maybe the next set of conversations that we have. Maybe even, heck, let's say, uh, you know, Alex and Dan are back, you know, and it's 2034. And, you know, we're, we're going strong and we're, we're still, you know, bringing to light some of these complicated issues. How, how has the narrative changed in, in a decade? Well, what I'm pushing towards is really trying to understand what I'm calling the AI truth case, because it, it is more complicated than it's, it's just like your world, man. It's complicated. You know, it, it, it sounds great reduce friction in the workplace. And then when you really get your hands dirty, it's freaking complicated. Well, the same is true with when we start talking about truth. Do we want greater truth? Do we want to be able to look at a, a scientific finding that we come out every day that says, you know, eat more chocolate, it's great for you, you know, kind of thing. Well, is that true? You know, that's a small, maybe trivial example, but maybe not so trivial example. What would it mean if we had a more systematic way of determining the truth, you know, and the transparency thing. To the extent that I'm able to advance that, and then I think that changes our discussion a few years from now. And I think it feeds back into even the discussion that you and I had, you know, it's like your fear of, uh, of AI taking your job. That's a legitimate fear, but what's the truth? You know, is there, what is the potential for increased satisfaction in your work? Would you trade you know, having a little bit less of a chance of getting a job for if you do get the job, you're going to be much more satisfied with it. You know, again, that's to me, that's an AI truth case. It's obscured by all this arm waving nonsense that we always have to deal with in these things. And we, we just we've grown used to having to sort that out ourselves. What if we could get a little edge on that where you could quickly say, no, I can get right to the heart of that issue here are the numbers. Here are the facts. I can still make my own decision, but now I feel much more empowered to know that rather than feel like I think a lot of us do a lot of times, like we're in a spin cycle of a washing machine. You know, all we can do is get one distorted viewpoint or another distorted viewpoint. So that's where I hope a future conversation might be is around this question of the AI truth case. That's ambitious, but I think we'll get there. All right. These are important dialogues. 
So I know we're going to cross publish this with AI Truth Ethics, but maybe so so that the AI in the future of work listeners know where to hear more from you and about you. Maybe talk a little bit about the new podcast. Right. So the the new podcast is AI Truth Ethics, which is trying to focus in on this particular issue. But this is one that I also want to bring to my skeptical audience because, you know, as we said, I mean, it almost sounded like we had kind of pre-scripted uh, something for uh, an advertisement, <laughs> an advertisement for uh, people rain, but not at all. I mean, people need to, I, I hope people appreciate um, just what you're doing, although you should be great for what you're doing, but how AI use cases like yours are going to really shift the dynamic, going to shift this conversation that in so many ways that we're talking about is kind of being hijacked right under our feet. The conversation about AI, its potential, what it means is being hijacked. And when we ground ourselves in the use cases like what you're doing, I think it's a much more interesting conversation. And I think it's a much more hopeful and uh, promising conversation. So I really want to share that with as many people as possible. Alex, it's been an absolute pleasure. I'm looking forward to meeting more of your community and, and doing future versions of this. Great, Dan. Thanks again. It's terrific. Thanks again so much to Dan Turchin for joining me today. There were so many great little subtle twists to this conversation, and it was truly a pleasure to talk to someone who is a frontline soldier and is really kind of making things happen that are going to affect all our lives in the future. And there's a genuineness and a groundedness, like I kept saying in this conversation, that I really appreciate it. Hope you like it too. Let me know what you think. Until next time, take care and bye for now.